Hi, Andre here from the MSAG team. This video in our interview series covers a popular subject for interviews, Jehovah's Witnesses. Let's find out about how Jehovah's Witnesses are closely linked to the core pillars of medical ethics. Timestamps in the description below. Hi guys. Today we're looking at how to answer a common medical school interview question, focusing on medical ethics. The question is as follows. A Jehovah's Witness is unconscious and dying from bleeding. Would you transfuse blood? This question tests your knowledge and understanding of the ethical pillars and how to apply them. In this video, we hope to improve your knowledge and understanding of the topics of Jehovah's Witnesses, autonomy, consent, and provide you with guidance on how to structure and approach this type of question in a medical school interview. As well as improving your core knowledge, we will also give you a sample interview answer at the end of this video for your reference, which you then can compare with your own. So, can you tell me some of the most important points to consider when you're treating a Jehovah's Witness? Perhaps the most important medically relevant point here is that this is a group of people who do not always accept blood transfusions. This is due to their religious beliefs in Christianity, in which they consider blood transfusion to be a violation of God's law based on their interpretation of scriptures written in the Bible. Accepting a blood transfusion willingly and without regret is considered a sin. Members are directed to refuse blood transfusions even in a life or death scenario. The willingness or acceptance of blood transfusions is a grounds for expulsion from the faith. What do you already know about the legal background surrounding Jehovah's Witnesses? The origins of the ethical legal debate stem back to 1945, when organisations collectively called the Watchtower Society, which provided legal representation to Jehovah's Witnesses, concluded that blood transfusions are contrary to divine law. The Watchtower Society, to this day, provides pre-formatted, durable power of attorney documents prohibiting the transfusion of major blood components, in which members can specify which allowable fractions or the extent of treatments they will personally accept. Before we go any further, we have mentioned two points that I want to discuss in a little more detail. First of all, how many of you know what a power of attorney is? A lasting power of attorney, or LPA, is a legal document that allows a person, or more than one person, known as attorneys, to help make decisions for a patient if they lose the capacity to do so. It is important to note that there are two types of LPA in the UK. The first allows an attorney to make decisions on health and welfare, and the second allows an attorney to make decisions on properties and financial affairs. It's important that you distinguish which type of LPA is in place to ensure that you are acting in line with the law. Often, this document is carried by an individual, for example, a Jehovah's Witnesses red card, which clearly lays out their wishes. You may have also heard of an advanced directive. This is a legally binding document that states that the wishes of the individual, often with regards to their medical treatment. In this scenario, therefore, it would state that the patient would not accept any type of blood transfusion under any circumstances. This request must be followed. Often, advanced directives may be carried with an individual, for example, a Jehovah's Witnesses red card, which states the limit of the treatments the patient may wish to have. However, it may not always be carried by the patient, so it is important to take reasonable steps to identify if one exists prior to treating the patient. Now, let's move on and discuss the second piece of terminology that we have already introduced to you. What do we mean when we talk about allowable fractions of blood? Blood can be divided into four main primary components, red cells, white cells, platelets, and plasma. For example, red cells contain the protein haemoglobin. Products developed from human and animal haemoglobin have been used to treat patients who have had massive blood loss. Jehovah's Witnesses may decide that they are willing to accept certain fractions of blood, depending on their own beliefs. Similarly, many accept special procedures to replace blood loss. These include hemodilution and cell salvage. In hemodilution, blood is diverted from the body, mixed with other artificial fluids, and later returned to the patient. Cell salvage captures and returns blood lost during surgery. Blood is then recovered from a wound or a body cavity, washed and filtered, and then reinfused into the patient. The important thing to note here is that the patient would receive their own blood and therefore this practice is more widely accepted amongst Jehovah's Witnesses. It is unlikely that you will be expected to know all the intricacies of the various types of transfusion and components of blood, 
However, this summary should provide you with some basic content to set you apart in your interview. Now, we have a bit of background information about Jehovah's Witnesses. How would you go about answering this question in an interview style format? The most important thing in an interview is to have a clear structure to your answer. This helps to organise the information in your own mind, as well as deliver it in a professional and time efficient manner. The first part of your answer should be an introduction. Take a minute to think about the important points to include in an introduction for this question. It would be pertinent to define what you know of a Jehovah's Witness and highlight what specific issues you need to consider in this situation. Then, we should move on to the main body of your answer. Here, we need to give a balanced argument based on the principles of medical ethics. We must consider the four pillars of medical ethics and the three C's, which are explained in detail in our other videos. As this question asks for your opinion, we need to explain arguments for and against blood transfusion in this scenario. Let's think about the arguments for transfusion the patient. If we consider the pillar of autonomy, as the patient is unconscious, we can say that they do not currently have the choice, and therefore the autonomy to choose to be transfused. Following on from this, would you say that the patient has capacity to consent to having a blood transfusion? The answer is no, because they are unconscious and therefore cannot fulfil the four requirements that patients need to have capacity. What other ethical pillars do we need to consider in this situation? This patient is suffering from a bleed, and as such, the likely measure to save their life is a blood transfusion. To not transfuse would be to allow the patient to die, which would be the ultimate harm for the patient. This would not be in the best interest of the patient, Therefore, the patient should be transfused based on the principles of beneficence and non-maleficence. What about the arguments against blood transfusion? Can you think of any pillars we have used previously which could also be applied to argue against administering blood transfusion to this patient? When in good health, the patient has a right to choose whether they would like a blood transfusion. If they have gone through the appropriate channels, i.e. an advanced directive or a Jehovah's Witness card, to make their wishes and religious beliefs clear, transfusion the patient would be an obvious breach of autonomy. Therefore, although the patient does not have the capacity at the time of this scenario, it is important to indicate to the examiner they may have previously been assessed for capacity and refuse to consent to a blood transfusion should this scenario ever occur. Another important point to consider is the immediate benefit to the patient by providing a blood transfusion is that their life will be saved. However, there may be negative impacts on the patient in the intermediate or long term. They may be shunned or expelled from their faith. As such, they may suffer negative psychological consequences. This example strongly demonstrates the point that what you may believe to be in the patient's best interests may not be what the patient views to be in his or her best interests. The patient may argue that they would rather die than live with what they believe is the burden of sin. The final part of our answer should be a conclusion where you summarise the information that you have been given so far and give your opinion on a binary answer. It is difficult to answer this question with a binary response, yes transfuse or no don't transfuse, because we have such little information. This is therefore an appropriate place to demonstrate to the interviewer your awareness of the topic and explain in an ideal world what further information you would seek prior to making this decision. What other factors do you feel are important in your decision making? Obviously you would want to know about advanced directives and living wills, However, would your decision be different if an individual had been a devout Jehovah's Witness for over a decade versus someone who had only recently converted a few days ago? Or if they did not actively practice their religion? Would your decision be different if the patient was a child? Let's also not forget that there are many alternatives to blood transfusion, as we discussed earlier. You would also want to know if any of these were feasible for the patient. Once you've engaged with such information gathering, it is important to refer to the concept of escalation. Always avoid making difficult ethical decisions alone. Escalate or discuss with senior healthcare professionals, ethical committees, professional law societies or judicial systems to ensure the optimum outcome for the patient and to protect the medical practitioner from a legal dispute. Finally, Always end with your opinion. A successful answer should show that you are able to weigh up the two options and be able to come to a logical conclusion. 
There is no right or wrong in these scenarios. One could always say that there are some situations under which the decision not to transfuse would be easier, such as if an advanced directive is in place stating that the patient is not to be transfused. Then the medical team is legally bound to respect the wishes of the patient. However, it is important to highlight that if this information was not available, all efforts should be made to gather more facts before making a decision. After stating your decision, give a brief rationale as to why you feel this way. Remember, each ethical case is unique and you must look through all the facts thoroughly prior to making a decision. Let's now look at a case study of a real life situation where Jehovah's Witnesses were involved in an order to give you an idea of the kinds of variables one must consider when making such ethical decisions. The case dates back to 1992, where, following a road traffic accident, a pregnant adult woman, aged 20, after speaking to her mother for 45 to 60 minutes in her private bedroom, signed a form refusing a blood transfusion. Unfortunately, following a caesarean section, her baby was delivered stillborn and the woman's condition deteriorated rapidly. She lost a considerable amount of blood and needed a blood transfusion. This case went to Court of Appeals. The court allowed a blood transfusion to be carried out on the 20-year-old Jehovah's Witness. The court effectively overrode her refusal on the basis that her decision had been heavily influenced by the undue influence of her mother, a devout Jehovah's Witness, thus invalidating her consent, or in this case, her refusal, on the grounds that she was coerced. The trauma of the road traffic accident, her blood loss, the medication she was on, meant that she was not capable of making such a life or death choice. She was deemed to lack capacity, and therefore her consent or refusal was not valid, thus was not legally binding on the doctors. The patient was transfused in her best interests. This case highlights the importance of escalating such ethical decisions and analysing all of the facts available. To conclude, Let's look at a model answer for this question. A Jehovah's Witness is unconscious and dying from bleeding. Would you transfuse blood? Jehovah's Witnesses are a group of people who do not always accept blood transfusions due to their religious beliefs. Blood transfusions are sourced from donor individuals and therefore do not comply with the beliefs of most Jehovah's Witnesses. As I understand, a Jehovah's Witness is unconscious and dying from bleeding. The question posed to me is, would I transfuse blood? Well, I need to consider arguments for and against blood transfusion in this scenario. I will explain the arguments for blood transfusion first. If we consider the pillar of autonomy, as the patient is unconscious, we can say that they do not currently have the choice, and therefore the autonomy to choose to be transfused. Following on from this, the patient does not have the capacity to consent to having a blood transfusion, as they are unconscious, and therefore cannot fulfil the four requirements that patients need to have capacity. This patient is suffering from a bleed, and as such, the likely measure to save their life is a blood transfusion, which would be agreeable with the pillar of beneficence. To not transfuse would be to allow the patient to die, which would be against the pillar of non-maleficence. This would not be in the best interest of the patient, therefore the patient should be transfused. On the other hand, arguments for not transfusing the patient would be as following. When in good health, the patient has a right to choose whether they would like a blood transfusion. If they have gone through the appropriate channels, for example, if there was an advanced directive in place, or if the patient had a Jehovah's Witness card to make their wishes and religious beliefs clear, Transfusing the patient would be an obvious breach of autonomy. Therefore, it is important to search or ask relatives about the existence of these documents. Although the patient does not have capacity at the time of the scenario, they may have previously been assessed for capacity and refused to consent to a blood transfusion. Another important point to consider is that if we transfuse the patient against their will, there may be negative impacts on the patient in the intermediate or long term. They may be shunned or expelled from their faith, and as such, they may suffer negative psychological consequences. 
this would fall against the pillar of non-maleficence. In conclusion, it is difficult to give a definitive answer in this because we have such little information. In such scenarios, I would strive to seek further information, such as if an advanced directive or LPA existed. If an advanced directive instructing against blood transfusion exists, it would be acting in good legal practice for the medical team to abstain from transfusion. I would also want to know how strictly this patient practiced his or her faith, as this may influence my decision making. I would also want to know if there were any alternative available to blood transfusion, as this may negate any ethical dilemma altogether. However, without such information, I would act as follows. I would be aware that this scenario is time dependent, so after finding out all the information I can from the patient and next of kin, I would want to act as soon as possible. The gravity of this situation would mean that I would always refer to a senior healthcare professional, such as a registrar or consultant looking after the patient, to guide my decision making. Ethical committees, medical defence unions and courts may also be needed or consulted, if appropriate, to ensure the optimum outcome for the patient. Ultimately, if no further information or advanced directives were available, I would choose to transfuse the patient based on the principle of non-maleficence. I also believe that as no documentation is found, this would be the safest thing to do for the patient, and any psychological harm I could potentially do could be dealt with at a later stage. Whereas by choosing not to transfuse, there would be no scope to negate the negative impacts of my decision making. Thank you for watching this video on the ethics of blood transfusions in Jehovah's Witnesses. This is a very common style of interview question, and I would encourage you all to go away and develop your own answer to this question. Watch our other videos to learn about other common ethical scenarios that you may face at your medical school interview. Thanks for watching. Did you know about the link between Jehovah's Witnesses and autonomy? If you have any questions about this topic as it pertains to medicine, ethical or otherwise, let us know in the comments below. If you found this video helpful, please leave a like, and if you want to see more medical school admissions content, then subscribe to our channel. We put out new videos every week. Best of luck on your admissions.